Funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Monday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. Governor Murphy and other state leaders are condemning an attack in Colorado Springs, Colorado this weekend, in which a gunman wearing body armor opened fire at an LGBTQ nightclub Saturday, killing five people and wounding at least 25 more. Police in that state say the 22-year-old shooting suspect is being held on five counts of murder and five counts of bias-motivated crime causing bodily injury charges. But those charges are subject to change. Authorities say at least two heroic patrons at Club Q helped prevent even more bloodshed by tackling and subduing the gunman until police arrived. The incident taking place just one day before Transgender Day of Remembrance, an international event held every November 20th to memorialize those who've been killed throughout the year due to anti-transgender violence. Well, this year, gatherings in New Jersey were held in Newark, Jersey City, Montclair, Princeton, and Asbury Park, where organizers read the names of those killed a list topping 300 people this year alone, and pointed to the current political climate for igniting hate, saying the community is used as a political lightning rod by both sides of the aisle, stressing the importance in the fight for justice. I don't think politicians understand that how much they uh, expose us to danger when they use us in their, um, their conversations, and when they use us in their ridicule, uh, and how they you know, try to uh, excite their base and, and how that creates so much more anger and hatred towards people that never met us before, you know, don't understand how beautiful we all are, how many good people are in this room right now. Uh, it's not fair, you know, that we have to go through this. Vigils are being held today in Asbury Park and in Teaneck later this week. This morning, Governor Murphy and the Attorney General holding a conference call with LGBTQ plus leaders, emphasizing there are no similar active threats in New Jersey, but law enforcement have been advised to remain, quote, extremely vigilant. The Colorado shooting, of course, rekindling memories of the 2016 massacre at the Pulse nightclub in Florida. Colorado authorities say the alleged gunman purchased the firearms recovered at the scene of the shooting, including an AR-15 style rifle. At the State House, guns were top of mind for lawmakers today, voting on a sweeping proposal to overhaul and limit the state's concealed carry gun law, sparking an intense debate and fierce objections from Republicans who say the bill is unconstitutional. That wasn't the only issue igniting protests in Trenton. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas is at the State House with the latest. Joanna. Brianna, I'm here in the State House where two of the most anticipated bills were being voted on today. The Temporary Workers' Bill of Rights in the Senate and the Concealed Carry Gun Law in the Assembly. Both have been hot button issues spurring intense debate. And for the gun bill, that's exactly what we saw today. This bill is about public safety more than it is about guns. We have made dozens of amendments to make this legislation better for both law enforcement and the public. The bill would require gun owners to take training courses, purchase liability insurance, and limit where a person can go with a concealed weapon. We know what the real problem is. The real problem are the criminals. The real problem are the bad guys and bad gals with the guns. But no, we don't want to target them. We want to target the most law-abiding citizens who are well-trained, go through police background checks. This bill automatically turns domestic violence victims, who more often than not are women, into criminals. If they as much step foot on the property of their ex to drop off their kids, 
a woman can be and will be charged with third degree offense and lost and possibly lose custody of those kids. The Republicans question its constitutionality in the wake of the U.S. Supreme Court decision expanding concealed carry nationally. It's the fact that the bill directly contradicts the Bruin decision, which you are required by your oath to follow. This law is blatantly unconstitutional. And then came the Workers' Bill of Rights. Advocates rallied today in advance of the vote that's been up in the Senate four times now. To demand that the New Jersey Senate and the Assembly pass this bill now. No more delays, no more excuses. The bill would provide protections for temporary workers, like requiring employers to pay salaries and benefits comparable to traditional workers, require better record keeping of violations that could pose a risk to workers, and more transparency so workers know what hours, pay, time off, and safety concerns they can expect with any job. But many in the business community are opposed to the bill, saying it puts undue burden on already struggling companies. I think the lobbying effects by big corporations, and I think the delaying tactics are what's stopping this bill. They're working without protections for safety. Um, we've already seen folks being killed, unfortunately. We don't know how many other people haven't reported their injuries for fear of reprisal, for fear of judgment. They're working without compensation. But the vote never happened. It's a tight margin. The bill's uh, got a lot of money against it. Uh, there's a lot of these temp agencies that make a huge amount of money that have had a history of abusing workers for years and years and they're not going down without a fight, spend a significant amount of misinformation. So as a result of that, it's a very tight vote. Uh, as a result of that, we don't have those votes today, but we think we will next month. When they learned, advocates began protesting outside the Senate chamber, with one being escorted out. <laughs> So with just a few weeks left to go in the session, Democrats still can't muster the support in their caucus for this bill. It makes you wonder, will it ever happen? In Trenton, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. The legislature is also tackling the judicial vacancy in the state, today considering four new nominees vying to be superior court judges. As Ted Goldberg reports, it's progress, but not nearly enough to chip away at the massive backlogs in state courts. Things are on fire out here um, in the legal world, and it's just not being met with the response that it needs to be. New Jersey's collection of superior court vacancies is creating major problems in the legal world. Our domestic violence backlog has increased tenfold. Um, so if you need to go to the court because you've been harmed by a partner, or a spouse, or a significant other in a domestic violence case, you're going to feel uh, that, that ramification of being deprived your day in court. There's no question that we need to fill some more of these vacancies. There's no doubt about that. State Senator John Bramnick defends New Jersey's judiciary system, which requires judges to be appointed by the governor and approved by the Senate. He says it leads to a fairer judiciary, even though it's more cumbersome than having judges be elected. The judiciary in this state, across the board, is probably the best in the nation, and it's because our system is really fair, and if somebody's crazy, they ain't getting through the system. There's a huge background check, application process, checking references, checking financial records. So it takes a tremendous amount of time. And I tell all the applicants, however much time you think it's going to take, it's going to take a lot more. So yeah, we could do better. Another obstacle is senatorial courtesy, which can delay confirmation if people want to play politics. If somebody is from a particular county, the senators from that county also have to sign off on the nominee. And there's some horse trading that goes on as well. And uh, But I think all in all, the people of New Jersey can be very confident that only the best legal minds are being put on the bench. Gerilyn Lawrence leads the New Jersey State Bar Association, and she says these vacancies aren't just business as usual. 35 judges have been confirmed this year, and as of this morning, there were 69 vacancies statewide, with more expected as judges retire. Lauren says with no elections, there's only one way to fill the courts and have them running more efficiently. More collaboration between the governor and the legislature. 
That's the only answer. Uh, we do not have elected judges in this state. I think that's a nightmare, disaster, because it really makes judges and sometimes prosecutors politicians. We absolutely have plenty of qualified candidates. It's the speed within which they're being vetted. The Senate Judiciary Committee heard testimony from five nominees today, four of whom were nominated over the summer. Robert Jones has been nominated for a second term on the Superior Court, and like the other nominees, he spoke briefly before he was approved by the committee. A young woman said this to me recently. Judge, I was mad at you for sending me to treatment. Thank you for saving my life. I hear this se sentiment often in my role, and it doesn't get any better than that for a judge. Just to be sitting here before you today is a true testament that children from the inner city, educated in the poorest school districts, can as aspire and attain their dreams. Next up for these candidates is a vote in front of the full Senate, a first step towards filling these vacancies. Chairman, the nomination is released. Thank you very much. In Trenton, I'm Ted Goldberg. NJ Spotlight News. Meanwhile, Democratic lawmakers are scrapping plans to permanently put abortion rights in the New Jersey state constitution. As first reported by NJ Globe, legislative leaders pulled a proposal that would have asked voters to enshrine the right to an abortion through a 2023 ballot referendum, but stopped short after losing support from members of the party and key groups like Planned Parenthood of New Jersey and the ACLU. Well, state leaders already codified abortion access earlier this year when Governor Murphy signed the Freedom of Reproductive Choice Act. But a constitutional amendment would mean it can't be repealed without the consent of voters. Well, some abortion rights activists said the proposal was more about boosting turnout for Democrats during an off-year election and instead want lawmakers to address issues with accessing reproductive care. Advocates from Planned Parenthood were also worried the language used for the ballot question could cause confusion and end up hurting the cause. A high-profile Democratic operative pleaded guilty in federal court today on two counts of fraud. Antonio Teixeira, the former chief of staff to state Senate President Nick Scutari, admitted in a Newark courtroom today that he committed tax evasion and wire fraud during 2014 as part of a scheme with Sean Cattle, the political consultant at the heart of a murder-for-hire scheme. Teixeira's attorney says he's not involved in the murder case, though the fraud was uncovered as part of that investigation. Teixeira faces a maximum of up to 25 years in prison and must pay about $55,000 in restitution for his crimes. He's scheduled to be sentenced in March. Well, it's not just U.S. Senator Bob Menendez, but his wife, who is now under scrutiny by federal prosecutors, looking to determine whether she improperly received gifts or services in exchange for political favors from her husband. According to the Wall Street Journal, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York sent subpoenas to associates of Menendez's wife, Nadine Arslanian, whom he married in 2020. But the investigation dates back to 2019, with federal authorities probing possible undisclosed foreign lobbying and other violations of federal law on the part of Menendez, who's a top-ranking member of Congress. A spokesperson for the senator said he is aware of the investigation and will cooperate with any official inquiries, but denies wrongdoing. Joining me now is Corinne Ramey, reporter for The Wall Street Journal, who broke this story. Corinne, Ramey, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you for sharing your reporting with us. What have you been able to learn about what investigators are probing here with regard to the senator's wife now? So what we've learned is that the senator's wife, Nadine Arslanian, who he married in 2020, is a major focus of federal prosecutors' investigation into Senator Menendez. The prosecutors are looking at gifts and favors that she have, may have received from people who uh, sought some sort of official action from the senator. Is there any indication uh, what those political favors or actions uh, were linked to or, or whom they were linked to? Because through your reporting, we learned that there were subpoenas sent out to several of, of her associates included. So we know that subpoenas went to her associates and that prosecutors have asked about her. 
probably what gives us the clearest picture of the early bit of the investigation is some court filings from 2020 that show the prosecutor or that investigators executed search warrants at the home and business of one of her associates. At this point, the investigation, according to those court documents, related to charges that are violations of foreign lobbying laws and other sort of similar statutes. And our understanding now is that it's looking more at public corruption. How does that square um, when you're talking about a, a senior member of Congress, a, a senator who sits as the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, if in fact these are uh, the items that are being investigated? Of course, we don't know at this point. None of that has been confirmed. Um, I think we do know that as chair of the Foreign Foreign Relations Committee that Senator Menendez sat in a position of power and that the allegations and court documents, well, not, they do not mention the senator, but they are about um, a halal certifying business and a designation that it received from Egypt. And so it is conceivable that U.S. officials in powerful positions could have had some influence in that in that designation. Is there any indication, Corinne, that we could see a similar situation play out like we did in 2017 when the senator sat trial? Of course, um, we all know what happened there. Um, are we looking at sort of a, a deja vu here? This is the third federal investigation for the senator in about a decade or so, I believe. Um, it's hard to say. In cases in general, federal prosecutors don't tend to bring charges unless the case is pretty buttoned down and the chance of a conviction is high. But I think public corruption is a really tricky area. It's tricky under the law. There have been some uh, po uh, Supreme Court decisions that narrowed the scope of what's considered public corruption. And so these cases are hard. And we don't know how, whether there could be charges, whether the investigation might eventually be dropped. Uh, Corinne Ramey with The Wall Street Journal, thank you so much. Thank you. A Caldwell mob is speaking out and demanding her local officials have a conversation about racism after a neighbor called the police on her nine-year-old daughter who's black for spraying trees to save them from spotted lanternflies. As Melissa Rose Cooper reports, the story is sparking debate and support from those outside New Jersey. Bobby has not been the same since that day. You know, I'm doing my job, you know, just the same way the officer did to let her know emotionally and even physically that she didn't do anything wrong. Yet it's a thought Monique Joseph says her nine-year-old daughter, Bobby, questioned last month after a police officer approached them while Bobby was spraying trees with a homemade solution to kill spotted lanternflies. Like my oldest daughter, Hayden, said, Bobby wanted to do something that made her feel like she was helping the environment. And it literally just came from that. You know, like, wow, I hear about it on the news, my teachers are talking about it, and there are two trees on my block. Maybe I can save those two trees. So it was shocking for Joseph to learn her neighbor, former city council member Gordon Lashi, someone she says she has had friendly interactions with in the past, called police. Hold on, please, Fetch Warren. Yeah, how you doing? Uh, this is Gordon Lashi. I'm at 15 Elizabeth Street. Um, there's a little, a little black woman walking and spraying stuff on the sidewalks and trees on Elizabeth and Florence. I don't know what the hell she's doing. It scares me, though. Initially, when I spoke to him immediately after, my first reaction was, let me, let me ask him why did he feel the need to call. Um, in that conversation, he told me two things that do not correlate with the 911 report. He told me he thought she could have been a lost little girl or she could have been a little old lady with dementia. I immediately challenged that. What, did you ask her if she was lost? You know, how could Bobby be lost on her street? You know us, you know Bobby. And his response was, you can never be too safe. People are crazy out here, Monique. Lashi's call to police now raising concerns of biased treatments and racism. His attorney, Greg Massera, denies racial profiling was involved, but because of the accusations, he says Lashi and his family are now getting physical threats. But the incident is drawing support from people within the community and beyond who want to make sure Bobby understands she did nothing wrong. So when I read the story, 
And I saw her testimony, it immediately just broke my heart because I, because these are things that Black girls go through on a day-to-day -day basis. They're, they're not even allowed to be children and just explore the world where there's adults that are actually genuinely trying to ruin their childhood. So I, you know, I not only, and not even just ruining their childhood, but literally trying to siphon their brilliance. Dr. Ijoma Opara is an assistant professor at the Yale Public School of Health in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Growing up as a black girl in New Jersey herself, it was important for Opara to show Bobby black women scientists who, like her, are also looking for ways to save the environment. So she invited Bobby and her family for a tour of the science department. I imagine how excited she must have been to go out in her community and say and save her, you know, her trees and her plants it like her like the state you know incur is encouraging people too so i i didn't want her to walk away from that experience thinking this was a bad thing i wanted to really work with the family to replace that bad memory with a really positive and impactful memory that will last a lifetime joseph says she's grateful for the support i don't want bobby to lose her steam for stem i don't want her to lose her wonder i don't want her to lose her enthusiasm for nature and it starts where? At home. Joseph is also hoping what happened to her daughter can be used as a teaching moment so other black and brown children never have to be afraid to be at home, a place where they're always supposed to feel safe. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, despite growing concerns about a possible recession, New Jersey's economy looks stable. The latest economic reports show the state is continuing its streak of steady private sector job growth and strong revenue collections. How long the good news lasts is another question, though, and it's one we're going to put to budget and finance writer John Reitmeyer, who joins me now. John, hey, good to see you. So what are we looking at in these reports that tell us New Jersey may be in a better standing than some would expect? Yeah, Brianna, it's nice to be with you again. And so what we do is we can look at what's happening with both jobs and with uh, revenue collections from state taxes to kind of get a snapshot, at least, uh, you know, as conditions are right now or have been for the last few months. And really across, you know, a lot of different areas, we're seeing some strong signs of economic strength. And so that's um, tax collections overall are strong, including the income tax, which is the budget's biggest source of revenue in New Jersey. And job growth, that private sector job growth has been running uh, net positive for the last 30 months now. Uh, and the unemployment rate remains lower in New Jersey than, than nationally. And so these are all good signs. You know, we look at trends and right now the trends are all good. Um, there may be some areas where there's some trouble spots that we're gonna keep an eye on, but at the top line, you know, when it comes to jobs and tax revenue, things are looking pretty good as we look toward the end of the calendar year. But that's not everything, right? I mean, there are some indicators, as you write, that some of these uh, pieces could be slowing down. We could actually be on the verge of that. Yeah, and I think the big one to keep an eye on is what's happening in the real estate industry. You know, the Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates in response to high inflation. And that's, you know, having an impact on the mortgage industry. And so people are probably seeing a, a little less uh, in their budget be available for an actual home price because they're banking and paying higher mortgage interest. And, and Treasury has reported that the tax revenue from the realty transfer tax in New Jersey is down in was down in October compared to the same month last year. And so that's definitely an area to keep an eye on. We may be at the beginning of a slowdown when it comes to the real estate industry. And, you know, that has the potential to bleed into other areas. So certainly something to keep an eye on. And then in that jobs report, the finance sector showed some net losses in jobs mm -hmm. last month. And so that's another area we're sort of looking at to see if a trend develops. But does a slowdown equal recession? I mean, how concerned should people be about that? Because there are a lot of indicators um, that analysts look at and, and by most accounts, we're pretty darn close. Yeah, you know, it, it can be difficult to, to use a label um, and different recessions even have different impacts. And so we'll have to see whether something technically meets a definition or not. One thing to keep in mind is the state's most recent budget saw its budget reserves padded. And so that's always a good thing. If there are some revenue losses in the short term, the state would have the resources available to avoid some of the big budget cuts that we've seen in past years during economic downturns. All right, John Reitmeyer, thank you as always. You're welcome.
And it'll be a short week for Wall Street with the Thanksgiving holiday. Here's a look at how the markets closed today. Support for the Business Report provided by NJTIA's New Jersey Conference on Tourism, December 1st and 2nd at Resorts Casino Hotel in Atlantic City. Event information online at njtia.org. And that's going to do it for us tonight. Make sure you head over to njspotlightnews.org and follow us on our social media platforms to keep up with all the latest news on the Garden State. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire NJ Spotlight News team, thanks for being with us. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together and Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. NJM Insurance Group has been part of New Jersey for over a century. We support our communities through NJM's corporate giving program, supporting arts and culture-related and nonprofit organizations that serve to improve the lives of children, rebuild communities, and help to create a new generation of safe drivers. We're proud to be part of New Jersey. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. I'm very grateful that I'm still here. That's me and my daughter when we went to celebrate our first anniversary. With a new kidney, I have strength. They gave me a new lease on life. I'm still going everywhere and exploring new places. Nobody thought I was going to be here. Nobody. And I look forward to getting older with my wife. That's possible now. We're transforming lives through innovative kidney treatments, living donor programs, and world-renowned care at two of New Jersey's premier hospitals. They gave me my normal life back. It's a blessing. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together.